because I was, I was, well, I left the house before six, and she was still there, and she said it still went on, so it's off a little bit, yeah. Sheila Robinson, yeah. That's pretty, pretty uh, hard, straight line wind storm it came through, but uh, come over here, and all the lights was on, and everything's good, so I said, well, storm looked like it passed, so those that can make it will have church, amen, amen. So this coming uh, Friday and Saturday, uh, if, you, if you'd like to go to this women's conference, uh, it starts at the 6.30 on the 10th on the Friday, and then back at 9 a.m. on that Saturday morning. Then there'll be an outreach uh, from that conference uh, that they'll be doing the following Saturday at 9 a.m. And all this will be at the Providence Missionary uh, Church there uh, in Uptown Lincoln, and it's up behind the old Sears uh, Moore's Chapel, ain't that the name of that church that's on the road right there? You turn by that little church between Moore's Chapel and Old Sears, and it goes back up in there. So, uh, well, y'all, I hit the button. It's all good. Hang on a second. Praise the Lord. Come here, Brother Mike. It's time to do the prayer request. <laughs> Let's remember Fanny. She's still in the hospital. And uh, Loretta Black, back issue. Doctor did a culture. Tony Wall, mass and kidneys and lungs and spine. Let's remember him. We know God's able to do great and mighty things if we call upon him. Amy Cushman, post surgery, dialysis, Ronnie, diagnosis. Ronnie and Sheila didn't go good. Well, let's, let, let's really re remember this request here. And uh, Ronnie and Sheila, let's remember both of them. Ronnie's taking them treatments for cancer. And Odell Hester, he's got cancer on his left lung. George Fisher, mental recovery. That's Tab's bi uh, bi biological dad. And uh, Christy Griffin, sick. And uh, appointment at Wake Forest in August. Let's remember her. Graham Engel, evaluation results, author Wright, stage four lung cancer, and it can't be treated. Edwin Huffman, awaiting parole board decision, let's remember him. And Eddie Cantrell, uh, his heart issues, that's my brother, he's uh, doing he's doing good. Uh, the doctor checked him and said it was his stomach been causing him the problem. But let's remember him for his salvation. He's kind of hard-headed, and I've been talking to him, and he knows he needs God, but he just uh, he just uh, won't accept it. You know, he just thinks he's got plenty of time, you know, but we had not got plenty of time because God knows when our time is. And uh, let's remember uh, Caroline Barnett, high blood pressure and growth on eye and a biopsy. Madison Howington. Needs healing and salvation. Jenny Michaels who got bone cancer, and uh, Shirley Goodson who got COPD. Let's remember all these requests. We know God's able to do great and mighty things. You know, the Bible tells us to call on Him, and He'll answer us and show us great and mighty things which we knoweth not. And I believe it because I've seen it. I've seen God do great and mighty things. And uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer and go ahead and uh, believe God's going to do great things. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the privilege of being in your house tonight, God. We come here, Lord, 
expecting something from you, Lord God. You, you're the one, Lord, can take us and answer us and show us great and mighty things because your word promised it, God. And I know all these requests, Lord, you heard each and everything. You said, bring, make our requests known unto you, God, and that's what we've done tonight. We believe in God you're going to take and do these things, Father, we ask of you. We depend upon you on everything because you are the great king of glory. You're our redeemer. You're the only one that can we have salvation through, Lord, and we believe, God, that you're going to do great things through your son, Jesus Christ, and through your spirit, God. Let the Trinity of God be in this church, Lord, and let, him do, let them do great and mighty things, Lord. We praise you for what you do. You're great. There's nobody like you, God. We praise you in Jesus' name. Hey, fam. I should have let him hold it longer, huh? <laughs> you did good. It did. He's all right. I talked to my dad. I, I don't remember if y'all, I think I told y'all last Wednesday night, my dad was supposed to speak at a funeral this past weekend, and uh, I called him, asked him how it went, and he said, uh, he said well, I must have done all right. Everybody, everybody was talking about how good it was. I said, well, it. If if they didn't like it, they wouldn't have said anything at all. So, but uh, I, he he said he got through it. That's not anything he's used to. Sorry to throw you on the spot like that, but I think I got some dead batteries. But we'll figure that out after church. That ain't got nothing to do. Two remotes, both of them are dead batteries. That's bad. Ain't it? That's all right. God's good. Amen. Amen. Let's jump right back into our lesson that we've been working on for the last uh, a couple of weeks in Revelations chapter twelve. Uh, Trace, I'm gonna back up. To uh, twelve and three, we're going back up there and start back there because I, I did, we we started talking about the the great red dragon, the appearance of the great red dragon, uh, talking about who he was, what he was doing, uh, but we really didn't get through all the scriptures for that. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna just back up and and, uh, and and pick back up with Revelation chapter twelve, verse three. Everybody okay? All right. Everybody awake? All right. Good deal. All right. Let's read it. Eleven. Uh, Revelation twelve and three. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his head. So here we see this dragon, this, this, this great wonder that John sees in heaven. And, and, and this parallel with the church of the world, there always runs this, this other mighty antagonizing power, which is Satan's power. So anytime the church or God's people are moving forward and being what God's calling them to be, there's always going to be the enemy trying to stop the progress, trying to counterfeit the progress, the power, always trying to do something different to bring an antithesis of what, what God's trying to do. And so we, we see this uh, in this particular portion of the vision of what John is seeing here. Remember, this is one of those uh, visions that kind of steps aside from the normal things is even kind of looking back. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. But we, we see this parallel of Satan's power running along with the church's power. The true church has always had to contend with Satan's power, with Satan's dominion, with Satan's demons, with Satan's minions. All these things, the church has always had to contend with them. And so don't, don't think it's strange, the Bible says, concerning these fiery trials that come upon you. So when this stuff begins to happen, you just got to know that it's not anything new. Uh, his ploys are not anything new. The things that he tries to do and tries to accomplish, he's been attacking from day one. From, from the very conception of the world, when, when God said, let it be, and he put man and, and woman on the earth, we, we know at that particular point that God, uh, that, that Satan has been fighting uh, God's people at all those times. So we, we see this, this power of Satan that has always tried to hinder the church's progress and even destroy our hopes. Listen, let me stop here for just a moment. If the enemy can do anything to, that, to the church, it's, it's to rob you of your outlook and your hope. You've you got to know that that's what the enemy wants to do. If he can take your hope, if he can take your joy, if he can take your peace, if he can rob these things from you, you you'll, you'll discontinue to progress. You'll discontinue to press forward if you've lost hope. If I've got hope, I don't care what's around me or what's trying to hinder me or hold me back, I've got reason to keep pressing on. If I've got hope to know that if I can get through this struggle, if I can get through this trial, if I can walk through this storm, if I've got hope, there's something that gives me uh, strength to keep pressing on and keep moving forward. But that's what the enemy wants to do. He wants to rob you of your hope. He wants to take your joy and your strength from you so that you can't press on and you can't press forward. And that's always been attacking of the enemy. So, so, you know, it, 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 it's like I told you last Wednesday. If I 
know what the enemy's trying to do to me, if I know how the enemy's trying to mess with me, if I know what I'm up against, then, then I, I can put a plan together. I can formulate and, and not be caught by surprise. So, so if there's not anything new under the sun, if everything that has been shall also be, if I understand that from Scripture, then I know that the enemy's going to use the same tactics, the same lies, the same ways of trying to do things. And if I know that that's what the enemy's trying to do, then I can formulate a plan. I can put on the whole armor of God that I can stand against the wiles of the enemy and I can be the more than conqueror that God has called me to be. I don't have to live in defeat. I can live in victory. I don't have to get knocked down by the plans of the enemy if I know what's coming. If I see the punch coming, I'm going to duck out of the way. If I see the darts of the enemy coming, I can throw up my shield of faith or I can duck and let it go on by me or whatever I got to do to overcome the power of the enemy because I understand that greater is he that's in me than he that's in this world. And so that's the hope that I have have in Jesus Christ. And so he tries to destroy the church's hope. This truth is de demonstrated in this vision where John sees this great red dragon, which Revelation chapter 12 verse 9 identifies him as that dragon which was the serpent of old, the devil, Satan, who deceives the whole world, who was cast out to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So we see that this dragon in Revelation 3 is later identified as Satan. So the prophet Isaiah mentions something similar about him. Isaiah chapter 27, verse 1. In that day, the Lord with his severe sword, great and strong, will punish Leviathan, the fleeing serpent. Leviathan, that twisted serpent, and he will slay the reptile that is in the sea. So we, we know in the Garden of Eden that, it, that, that Satan appeared as a serpent unto Eve. Uh, he, she, it, it, he beguiled Eve through the serpent, so we know that that's always been a tactic of the enemy. Here uh, in Isaiah, he's seeing a vision of a Leviathan, a, a, a serpent, if you will, and he says that God's going to destroy that serpent. And so thank God that we're on the winning side. Jeremiah 51, 34. The Bible says, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, has devoured me. He has crushed me. He has made me an empty vessel. He has swallowed me up like a monster. He has filled my stomach with his delicacies, and he spit me out. This is where we concluded last Wednesday night. But let me tell you something. The devil is not here to play games with you. The enemy's not going to toy with you. He's got one mission, and that's to destroy you, to kill you, to rob you of your hope, to rob you of your dreams, to try to manipulate your life. He's trying his best. Even in this time, even in this day, he's trying to take even the little foxes and trying to destroy your vine. He's trying to rob you of your fruit. He's trying to rob you of your hope. He's trying to steal the, the fruit of joy from your life. He's trying to deceive you and, 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 and scoff at you and trying to get your mind all twisted. And this is what he's come to do. He's filled his stomach with my delicacies. Everything good that God has tried to give me, the enemy has tried to rob it away. He spit me out. Listen, when the devil's done with you, he'll, he'll spit you out just like you're just left over. Listen, friend, you got to understand that God is going to fight for you, that God is going to give you the victory, but you got to be willing to stand up for God and put one foot in front of the other and keep pressing toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Listen, friend, this is what the devil wants to do. He wants to destroy you. Tracy and I went to the hospital uh, yesterday, I believe it was. And my days and are all kind of confused right now, but I believe it was yesterday we went to the hospital. And I was walking out of the hospital, and I was singing an old Ron Canoli song to myself. And I started kind of singing it out loud. And, and, and the old song says, Going up to the high places, going up to the high places. Going up to the high places to tear the devil's kingdom down. And I was singing that song and I, I was going through the verses and all those stuff. But, but that's the victory that we've got to have. You know, as I'm walking out of a hospital where there's a lot of despair, there's a lot of sickness, and there's a lot of illness. There's no, there's no real joy when you're in the hospital. But to walk out of there with a victory song. That I'm coming out and I'm going to be victorious. It was, it was literal for Tracy and I that we walked out of Fanny's room and listened to her coughing and trying to catch her breath and, and all the things that she was struggling with. But to walk out of there and say that victory is ours. I don't care what I've seen. I don't care what I've experienced. I don't care what's around me. I know that the devil's trying to destroy, but I'm going to the high places and I'm tearing the devil's kingdom down and everything that he's taken from me, everything that he's robbed me of, everything 
everything that he's stolen from me. I put him on notice that I'm going back into his camp and I'm coming out victorious and I'm coming back with my stuff. It's too many times we in the church, we lay down and let the devil beat on us. It's about time that we stand up and be the vigilant ones that God has called us to be and let the devil know you've took my stuff, you've messed with me long enough and I'm going back into your camp and I'm not going there to stay but I'm coming out for the glory of God and I'm getting my stuff back. Can somebody say amen? This dragon in Revelation 12 and 3, the Bible said that it's red. It's the color of fire. It's the color of blood. This color shows the fierceness of the dragon. You, you, ever, uh, you ever been around somebody that's so mad, they red-faced? I used to have a temper that was pretty bad. Thank God he delivered me from it. But I get so mad, I, all I could see was red. You ever heard that statement? Couldn't see anything clear. Everything was red before me. And all I knew was the anger that was boiling inside of me. And then I think about this fiery red dragon. He's angry. Why is he angry? Because he once knew what it was to be in the presence of God. He once knew what it was to play the music before the throne of God. He knew what it was to enjoy God's presence. And because of his pride and his arrogance, he was cast out of heaven by God Almighty. Jesus said, I saw him fall like lightning as God threw him from heaven. He's mad. And anything and everything that God is trying to accomplish, the devil is there to try to destroy. God knows what he's doing. In this scripture, in this scripture, the dragons are ascribed only one head, but not this one. He's got seven heads. He's got ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. The seven heads represent seven mountain empires. That Satan uses to promote his mischief in the world. Look at Revelation chapter 17, 9 through 11. He said, here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. There are also seven kings. Five have fallen, one is, and the other has not yet come. And when he comes, he must continue a short time. The beast that was and is not is himself also the eighth. And is of the seven and is going to perdition. So back up to the ninth verse, please. You, you see in this particular passage of Scripture... That the, the, the seven heads on this, on this dragon are the seven mountains on which the woman sits. It's representative of seven different nations, the kings of these nations. The, 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 there's ten of them. Only seven of them have crowns. So three of them have yet to come into power. The Antichrist, remember, there's a small horn that comes up in the midst of all these and overtakes the other ones. That's the Antichrist. That's the devil. He's going to rise up in the midst of these nations and he's going to overtake them. And he's going to try to set up his kingdom here on earth. You understand where he's coming from? So this is, the, this is the concept of the dragon. The the horns, the crowns, are parallel to the ten toes of the image that Daniel tells us about. Daniel chapter 2, verse 40 through 44. And the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as a lion, inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything. And like iron that crushes, that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all the others. Whereas you saw the feet and toes partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. Yet the strength of the iron shall be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. And as you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another, just as iron does not mix with clay. And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Now, what Daniel is seeing here is that the devil's going to set up his kingdom. These horns, these, these, these kings, these crowns that we see, the devil's going to set up his kingdom. But in this last verse here, we see that God sets up his kingdom. And when God sets up his kingdom, it destroys everything. Why? Because of the fragility of the devil's kingdom. The devil tries to do things that doesn't make sense. He's the author of confusion. So things that he does doesn't work together. It's sort of like the, the, the people of Israel when they were trying to build the Tower of Babel. They were using bricks for stone and they were using uh, 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 slime for mortar. 
it, it, was, it was a futile effort that they were having to do because what they were about to put together would not stand. It would not last. That's the thing about the devil's kingdom, folks. The devil's kingdom is being put together and manipulated, but the way it's put together, it's fragile. The Scripture even says that it's fragile. It will not be able to stand. It will not be able to be, be held together. But when God sets up His kingdom, it will consume every kingdom that's on this earth. And then Jesus will be proclaimed as King of kings and Lord of lords and every kingdom of this earth will be destroyed and brought down before the kingdom of God so this is what Daniel's seeing the, 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 they're also the, the same as the ten horns on the terrible beast of which came one little horn this little horn plucked up three of the ten horns leaving only seven horns Daniel 7 verse 7 and 8 Daniel 7 7 and 8 he said after this I saw in the night visions and behold a fourth beast dreadful and terrible exceedingly strong it had huge iron teeth that was devouring, breaking in pieces and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little one, coming up among them before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. And there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking pompous words. It's the Antichrist. Think about this. What's this number? We learned about this a uh, couple of weeks ago. It's, it's six hundred three score and six. It's the number of a man. Look what he says here. In this horn, he has the eyes of a man and a mouth that's speaking pompous words. So he's being identified as a literal human being that is empowered by the power of Satan. The, the anointing of Satan, if I can put it that way. This Antichrist will be anointed by Satan to try to begin to establish and rule over these other different kingdoms to establish his kingdom. So, so we see this all taking place. Revelation chapter 13, verse 1. Look what it says here. There I, then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. So again, the Antichrist. Revelation 17, 11 through 17. He said, the beast that was and is not, is himself also the eighth. And is of the seven and is going to perdition. We stopped at that verse a moment ago. The ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have received no kingdom as yet. But they receive authority for one hour as kings with the beast. These are of one mind and they will give their power and authority to the beast. These will make war with the lamb and the lamb will overcome them. For he is the Lord of lords and the king of kings. And those who are with him are called, chosen, and faithful. Then he said to me, the waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. And the ten horns which you saw on the beast, these will hate the harlot, make her desolate and naked, eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God has put it into their hearts to fulfill his purpose, to be of one mind, and to give their kingdom to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. So, so we see here again that this war that's going to go on, the, the good news is is that the Lord is going to have victory in this situation. The good news is, if you're on the Lord's side, you're on the winning side. Doesn't mean there's not going to be struggles. Doesn't mean there's not going to be trials along the way. Doesn't mean there's not going to be heartache and pain. But along the way, God is going to be with you. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. He's going to see you through your struggle. He's going to see you through your trial. And know that in the end, that we win this war. Know in the end, that God will reign supreme. Know in the end, that Jesus Christ will be King of kings, Lord of lords, and we're going to be on the winning side. He said, we'll be faithful. We'll be true. Listen, they that endure to the end, the same shall be saved. So there's salvation to us if we'll just press on. Why? I'll go back to the first point. Because we've got hope and our hope makes us not ashamed but our hope gives us victory our hope gives us purpose our hope gives us reason to press on and be what God's called us to be so the antichrist king as it will be in the end time this is what's going on there, there, there's a confederation of ten nations actually of the old Roman empire the enemy is going to try to raise it back up again it was one of the most powerful empires of its time and it's going to give their power to the little horn who is the antichrist which is Satan's representative on the earth at that time. I got a portion of scripture. I'm going to skip that one. That's a little longer. But in Revelation 13, 1 through 10, you can, you can get that and look at that. So when the Antichrist is in full power, three of his kings will try to rebel against his authority. It's probably what's going to happen. 
And the Antichrist is going to bring them down. He's going to take over their, their authority. And he's going to make war with these three and pluck them up by the roots. It told us in Daniel 7 and 8 that he's going to pluck them up by the roots. And, he's going to, and, it, and in his horn, it's going to be the eyes of the man. He's going to speak pompous words. So this, this, this Antichrist, this man anointed by Satan, is going to take down three nations at one time and pluck them up from the very roots. When the other seven kings, who, who will rule this earth until Christ smites and destroyed, uh, 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 destroys his kingdom. Daniel chapter 2, 44 and 45. Again, he said, in those days, the kings of the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all the kingdoms and it shall stand forever. So that you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay and the silver and the gold. The great God who has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. The dream is certain and its interpretation is sure. In other words, what Daniel is saying here, what God is speaking will come to pass. You know, I sit back sometimes and I think to myself, you know, there are things that were prophesied throughout scriptures that we've yet to see. I wonder what Daniel was feeling when he was getting these dreams and visions from God of things that would not happen until thousands of years later. It absolutely amazes me the accuracy of the vision and the interpretation of the vision, how it relayed from Daniel all the way to John on the Isle of Patmos, how that God was bringing it all to pass. But Daniel said that dream is certain and that interpretation is sure. So we see all this happening. And we read it a moment ago in Revelation chapter 19. Oh, no, I didn't. Back up. Revelation 19, 17 through 21. Let me read that one. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather together for the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses, and of those who sit on them, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beasts, the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. Then the beast was captured. Good night. And with him, the false prophet who worked signs in his presence by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image, these two were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. And the rest were killed with the sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. I, I, I don't know, I don't have the, the, the actual reference to this. But they're saying that even now, birds of prey... Or their egg production has increased. Literally. They, they would do one to maybe two eggs in a laying. And now their egg production has increased to the point that now we're beginning to see more birds of prey. Remember, creation groans within itself. Creation understands the process and the times of God. God knows what he's doing. And for this, listen, th this war that's going to take place, the destruction, the Bible said that the blood of the men is going to come up to the bridles of the horses. Could you imagine that kind of destruction? And then the cleanup that's got to take place, God raises up the birds of the air, the predator birds to come in and clean all this mess up. So now we're seeing this increase in egg production in, in, in predatory birds. Uh, and so God is putting things together and making things right to bring all this to pass. It only tells me one thing. We're getting that much closer, folks. We're getting that much closer. Man, I don't want to miss it for nothing in the world. So these kings, that, 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 these seven kings that are left over will rule the earth with the Antichrist, but God sends his son in to destroy him once and for all. So the head is the governing power, and it signifies rulership. When crowned, the head, head signifies political rule. This dragon is an imperial personage. The dragon is like a dictator, if you will, that's going to rule over all these different nations. The seven heads are copies of the seven spirits. Revelations 4 and 5. Remember the seven spirits of God that are before the throne? The enemy's got a copy. He's got seven heads or seven kings, if you will, that are going to try to copy the seven spirits of God that are before the throne of God. So we got this copy that's going on. So, so with these heads, the Antichrist rules his seven mountain world empire. Again, in Revelation 17, 9 through 11, we read it earlier. I won't read it again. But it's talking about these seven mountain world empires that's going on. Jesus did not protest the claim of Satan to be the prince of this world. Look at John chapter 12, verse 31. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the rule of this world will be cast out. So Jesus is not arguing with Satan of his position. 
Jesus is not arguing with Satan, telling Satan, you know, that, that this is nothing that, that, you know, this claim that you made is, is, is a bad claim. Jesus is not arguing that at all. Look at John 14, verse 30. He said, I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming, and he has nothing in me. Again, he's calling Satan the ruler of the world. One last verse, John 16 and 11. He said, of judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. So he's not arguing with Satan with the position that he has in this world. So he's not debating that. So the hordes are the weapons of animals, their meanings of inflicting harm. I, I got a billy goat, and boy, he, he don't like it when I mess with him. Matter of fact, I had him cornered the other day, and that joker put his head against my thigh and just began to take that horn and push at me and bucket me and trying to carry on me. But the horns also gave me leverage because what I generally do when he tries to bully me, I let him know who's the boss. I grab him by his horns and I flip him over on his back and hold him down and pin him by his horns. Because if you can control his head, you can control the animal. So generally what I do is I take and I'll twist that neck and he'll holler and scream and kick and fuss and I'll just pin him down to the ground. I'll say, I'm the boss around here. And Tracy goes out there sometimes. He gets out there and starts flirting with my wife. And I let him know this is my woman. I ain't lying to you. He'll throw his lip up and make noises at it. Back off, buddy. This is my wife. Grab him by his horn, pin him to the ground, let him know who the man is. Now when I walk in the barn, he takes off running. He won't nothing to do with me. But that's, you know, the, this Antichrist has these horns. And these horns, you know, the, the billy of my, of my flock, i got other goats that have horns, but my billy, he's got these beautiful horns that curve and are long. And the bigger the horn, the more dominant he he presents himself. This is what's going on with the Antichrist. He's showing these seven horns that are trying to show his dominance in the world. He's trying to say, hey, I'm the big dog here. But then I believe what happens is, it, maybe not in a literal sense, but in a, in, in a philosophical sense of what I'm talking about with my billy goat, I believe God grabs him right by the horns, pins him to the ground, and says, I've got dominion over you. I'm the one that's the big dog on this camp. I'm the one setting up my kingdom. Your kingdom's coming down. And my kingdom will never be destroyed. I'm going to be victorious. And I'm going to show you who's who in the power of this world. I'm not denying that you've been ruling and reigning. But I'm about to take my position and my place on this earth. I'm going to set up me a new heaven and a new earth. And I'm going to set up my kingdom. And it will never be destroyed. I want the devil to be on notice tonight. That my God reigns supreme. That he overcomes. That he's victorious. And I'm thankful tonight that I'm on his side. And that I will overcome. Just like God said I would. That I will be more than a conqueror. Just like God said I would. These kings. They have one mind. They come together. They give their strength to the beast. In working together. And they're going to make war with the lamb. In Revelation 17. 13 and 14. That they're one mind. They give their power. They give their authority. Listen. If the devil can bring people together and bring them into one mind and one accord and they can have great power. How much more power could the church to be if we could get back to one mind and one accord? If we could get back to working together, if we could get back to saying, you know what, we're going to, we, listen, could you imagine 200, I want to say it's like 280 some churches that are in Lincoln County. Could you imagine if the body of Christ in Lincoln County could get together and say, you know what, we've been fighting against one another long enough. Let's fight together. And overcome the powers of hell that's right here in Lincoln County. Every meth, meth lab was shut down. Every prostitution ring was shut down. Every corrupt government, government official would have to step aside. Because if the church would rise up and be what the church is called to be, I'm telling you, there's no greater force in all the earth. Devils can't stand against the church. The gates of hell cannot prevail against the church. When the church is what the church is supposed to be, I'm telling you, victory will be ours. So if the devil is one mind, one accord, gives his power, and he begins to rule and reign, how much more victory could we have? This ten-horned red dragon shows the kingdom of Satan as it was demonstrated in those kingdoms in the book of Daniel. And finally, in the end time, in its final stages under Antichrist. So again, this kingdom is running parallel with the church in the world. This kingdom of Satan, this kingdom of darkness, is always trying to replicate what God and the true church are really being. You know, I wonder sometimes in the parallel run, I wonder sometimes 
if, if the lines don't get blurred. Can, can I talk about this just a moment? Sometimes I believe the lines get blurred between what the enemy's doing and what God's doing because I think sometimes there's crossover. Jesus warned us of this. He said, in the last day, there'll be many come in my name. There'll be many false Christ. And so as we, as we begin to see us get closer and closer to this coming, coming together in this war that's going to ultimately happen because the, the lines are going to become distinct at some point or another. But right now, there's great apostasy that's taking place because I believe the lines are blurred. There's a lot of people standing up on pulpits on Sunday declaring the name of Jesus, but they're not living under the name of Jesus. Are you with me? There's a lot of people that are out there talking a good game and, and, and they got a lot of good things, but the lines are blurred. You know, Paul warned us, I think it was the Corinthian church, where he told him, he said, you got to come out from among them and be separate. you got to touch not the unclean thing that I can receive you. But we blurred the line. It, and I'm not going to lie to you. I, there's, there's been times I've contemplated and even made some decisions to go in certain directions at times to try to get as close to there to attract people over to our side. And, I, you know, I don't know that we need to, to become more like them. I think we need to set the, the opposite so that they can understand and see the, the difference in the power. When the lines get blurred, people don't, they get more confused. And the enemy's just sitting back and laughing because we're losing power with God. We're losing fellowship with God because we're trying to blend and we're trying to fit. And we were never called to fit or to blend. We got to come together and tell the devil, we're not playing your games any longer. You know, I'm not trying to attract people from the other side into something that, that's not much different than what they left. They got to make a decision. They got to choose this day whom they're going to serve. They got to stand on the side of God. And this is, this is what we talked about Sunday. We, we might have to go in and, 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 and with vigilance save them from the fire. Let them know you don't want to play in that fire. You want Holy Ghost fire. You, want, you don't want the devil's fire. You want God's fire. And, and let them know there is a distinct difference. There has to be a line that's drawn that differentiates us from the things of this world. Otherwise, we've, we, we, we've blurred them and we're bringing nothing but confusion to the body of Christ. And the enemy just sits back and laughs about that. He thinks that's hilarious. So this, this dragon, this dragon, this evil mischief of the dragon. Look at Revelation chapter 12, verses 4. Look at the first portion here. With his tail, he drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. This dragon swings his tail through heaven, calls it about celestial principalities, and draws one-third to the earth. Literally what this scripture is depicting is the original fall of Satan. As I was reading it, I could see it. In, in, in Isaiah chapter 14, 14, we see it. But let me back up for just a moment. These stars are the one-third of the angels who fell with them. Angels are called stars in scripture. Job chapter 38, verses 4 through 7. Look what he says here. He said, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined this measurement? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? To what were its foundations fastened? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. So, so, so he's talking about these stars, these angels that are singing in the presence of God. But, but look what, listen, Satan was a star. He was a, one of the stars of heaven. Isaiah 14 and 12, look what he calls him. Oh, how are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How are you cut down, you who weaken the nations? He was a star, man. He was Lucifer, the, 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 the morning star. He was, I mean, he, was, he was the son of the morning. He was the brightness of the, of the heavens. But because of his pride and his arrogance, he fell. See, there are scriptures which speak of the original fall of Satan. Look at 2 Peter chapter 2 and 4. He said, for God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into the chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. Look what he's talking about. These angels that fell with Satan, God did not spare them. In Jude chapter 1 verse 6, the Bible says, and the angels who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of that great day. So Satan and that third of angels that fell, God has a judgment for them. These rebel angels have been plucked from their places, they've been dethroned, and they've been abased. And now they're nothing more than demonic spirits that are trying to attack the body of Christ. The majority, let me back up. Everything that we fight against is already defeated. I, let me say that again with confidence. Everything that we're already fighting against has already been defeated. Before you and I even got into a kicking war 
with these minions and imps that come up against us, the demonic spirits that try to oppress us and attack us. You ought to go ahead and know that it's already defeated. You've got authority to bind that devil. You've got authority to loose the power of God. You've got the keys of the kingdom to let the devil know, I'm not playing your games. There's a lot of times in my life, I just simply tell the devil, no, I'm not playing with you. I'm tired of fooling around with you. I'm tired of worrying over you. I'm tired, of, tired of getting belabored by you. I'm tired of it. No, I'm not playing your games anymore. When he attacks me in my mind and tries to get me in my thought process, and I recognize it, I tell the devil, no, I'm not playing this. I'm not going down that road again. Don't want to mess with that stuff anymore. Don't want to play those games anymore. He manipulates. He mocks. He scoffs. He, he does everything he can because they realize that this is their future. Everlasting darkness. Everlasting chains and the darkness of the judgment of that great day. Help us, Jesus. The dragon attacks the church. Look at the last portion of chapter 4, and we'll, or verse 4, and we'll end with this. The dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. Now, I've been drawing a parallel with the church here. I went back and read this chapter again today and kind of looked over it and tried to get my mind wrapped around it a little bit and thinking about my notes and stuff. You know, there's great parallels between Israel and the church. Now, we know that Israel brought forth Jesus Christ, and that's what they're talking about here, that the, the, this, this woman, Israel, is going to bring forth this child. But there's great parallels that take place between Israel and the church. And so Israel brings forth Jesus. And, and so now we're kind of looking back because you think about it. Herod tried to kill him even as a baby. He sent all the people there to kill the babies, trying to kill the babies and trying to get, take Jesus out, this king that would soon take over David's throne. Herod tried to kill him. Many times throughout his life and ministry, they tried to kill him. They, they wanted to throw him off the cliff one time, and he snuck right through the crowd and got away from them. He was not killed until his appointed time. But when that appointed time came, he laid down his life willingly. And just like he prophesied on the third day, he got up. The enemies always tried to stop the child. The enemy has always tried to destroy the children. The enemy doesn't like Jesus, and you being children of God, the enemy doesn't like you. So when the church brings forth her children, the devil's going to do everything he can to devour and destroy God's children. Peter put it best in his epistle. He said, you know, that, that, that this roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. That's all the devil wants to do. He wants to consume your life. He wants to consume your hopes. He wants to consume your dreams. He wants to take your joy. He wants to rob you of this. The thief cometh not but to steal, kill, and to destroy. That's all he wants to do. You know, we pray for little Graham, and all the devil wants to do is just manipulate Graham and, and, and destroy him, even at the age that he's at right now. All God wants to do to Mike is just consume him with the things of this world and, 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 and destroy him. And, 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 and well, all he wants to do is, is manipulate and try to mess with y'all's minds over your babies because he knows the heart of a mother is her babies you know in the next few days my wife and I we're going to have to face some of the toughest times because we're about to send our, our babies into an area we've never sent them before into a secular world scene Kelsey and I were working on her paperwork and, and, and when it got to her, her, her sex male female transgender other that's what it said on the application. Then the next line, it said, what, what pr pronoun do you prefer? I'm thinking, what kind of crazy questions are we asking? But that's the, the secular world mindset, the PC crowd, are trying not to offend anybody. We were walking around in a mall up there when we went up for orientation a, 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 about a month ago. And Mike, there was a man in there, wasn't much older than you, walking around in a dress and high heels in the mall. I looked at him, I thought, what in the world am I walking into up here? And my girls, listen, Trace and I pray, God, shut the door. If it's not your will, shut it. And the door is standing wide open, and we're saying, okay, God, we're going to have to trust you. 
but we're taking our babies and we're going to move them in that area. We're going to put them in that scenario for the cause of education. But we're having to say, God, we trust you. We trust you. Because I know the devil wants to devour my kids. I know the devil wants to take my children from me. I know that's what he's wanting to do. And what I want to do more than anything is lock them in the bedroom and slide some food under the door every now and then. Say, you all right in there? That's what I want to do. That's the dad in me. But also know that I got to be willing to say, you know what, God, I trust you. Remember what the scripture said we talked about this Sunday. He said, behold, I send you out as lambs among wolves. How shall they know the gospel except there be a preacher? And how can there be a preacher except he be sent? I can protect them from the world. But what I told my girls is you go shine your light in that world. You be the gospel. You be what God's called you to be. You live your life. I know the enemy wants to devour. But I don't, I don't put my fear in the weapons of the enemy. I put my trust in the power of God. And help them to overcome. And help them to be victorious. So you, you, you got to understand that that's what the devil's up to. That's what the devil's trying to account, accomplish. The church, the devil... The kingdom of heaven, the powers of darkness. There's always been these two great antagonizing forces that are on the earth. Light, dark. Good, evil. Church, Satan. There's always been this, this fight that's going on. And, and, and the opportunity to stand on the winning side and say, greater is he that's in me than he that's in this world. To stand on the, on the side of light where all things can be revealed. You know, the, the scary thing about the church is there are a lot of people that like to scurry to the darkness because we don't want to be known and we don't want to be found out. You're exposed. That's the good word. But Jesus said, there's not anything hid that shall not be known. There's not anything that's covered that shall not be uncovered. But let me tell you the beauty of God. The beauty of God is if you try to cover it, he's going to uncover it. But if you uncover it, God covers it. Man, that's a good God, ain't it? If I can come to God and say, God, here I am. I'm a mess. Look at all my junk. Look at all my stuff. God said, I can fix that. But I'm always trying to hide like Adam and Eve in the garden and put my fig leaves on. I'm always trying to hide because I'm afraid to hear his voice. What I've tried to cover, God will expose. But when I come before God and say, God, here I am. I'm a mess. Here I am, God, I've messed up again. Here I am, God, I've fallen. Here I am, God, my, 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 everything about me is bad and ugly and nasty. But, God, here I stand. I want to refer back to Zechariah 3. I talked about it Sunday morning. Joshua, the high priest, standing before God. Filthy, dirty, all a mess. And I see the grace of God in this. Because God never once looks at Joshua and said, how dare you? How dare you make a mockery of ministry this way? Never once. Satan was standing there beside him, and he said, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord rebuke you, Satan. And Satan had to leave. And without beating him up, without, without beating him over the head and telling him how bad he was, all God said was, come on, guys, get him cleaned up. This is my man. I'm removing his iniquity from him. I'm putting clean clothes on him. I'm setting a fair matter upon his head, and I'm establishing him and putting him back in position. I know he's fallen. I know he's messed up. I know he's blew it, but I'm not gonna, I ain't got time to beat him up. Kingdom work's got to go forward, and I need to get him back on the right track. I need him going in the right direction. I can't let him wallow in this pity party. I can't let him wallow in this bad place. I can't let the enemy beat him up over this. I got to get the devil out of the place. I got to get him back on the place, on the rock of the high, uh, of the high calling of God. I got to get him back on that rock and establish his going and let him know that he's mine and I'm going to set his feet to move it. Listen, friends, God will do that for you every single time. But Joshua had to be willing to come and stand before the presence of God. He didn't try to fix himself. He didn't try to clean himself. He didn't try to turn himself around. He just stood there and said, okay, God, here I am. Here I am. And that's all the devil wants to do. He wants to destroy you. He wants to beat you up in your failures. He wants to beat you up in your shortcomings. And listen, I'm not standing up here throwing stones because I have mine. I promise you. I go before the Lord just as much and probably more than some of y'all and stand there and say, done it again, God. Fought wrong, acted wrong, said wrong. Here I am. 
I need your strength. I need your healing. I need your forgiveness. I need restoration. Help me, God. The devil's beating up on me, and I've tried to fight him by myself, and I know that was foolish, and here I am. I fall, and I, I fall, and I need your help. You know what I find? His arm is not so short that he cannot save me. I find that he can reach down in the gutter and pull me out and say, I got you, son. I got you. What a gracious, merciful, loving God. The devil wants to destroy. But God said, if you'll just endure, if you'll just fight through it, if you'll just press toward hope, if you'll press toward that mark, I'll give you the victory. I'll help you to be more than a conqueror. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, love you so much. You're so good. And I just pray tonight, God, that some way, somehow, that folks have been encouraged by this word. I pray somehow, somehow tonight, God, that you would help people to realize and understand the great things that you're doing in their lives. God, what you're bringing them through. There's some here, God, and maybe even watching online, that between that rock and hard place, they're in that wall. But victory is theirs, God. Victory is theirs. Hope is theirs. Strength is theirs. Joy is theirs. And they just keep pressing. I can't get still right now. I got to keep moving. I got to put one foot in front of the other. I got to press. I got to push. I got to make my mind up that I'm going to, I'm going to win this thing. Victory is going to be mine. I ask the Lamb of God to help us. Let them be encouraged. If nothing else, God, let them just look back at all the victories you brought them through. Let them encourage themselves and say, listen, this, this time's no different. This moment's no different. The enemy's trying to do the same stuff again, trying to manipulate and bog me down and mess with me. Doesn't mean the intensity is the same. The intensity could be far heavier. But the closer we walk to you and the greater anointing we walk in, the more intense the fight has to become. But that anointing will still destroy the yoke of bondage. Thank you for that tonight, God. Keep us in your care. Keep us in your grace. Keep us in your mercy. Help us to walk in your victory. And I give you the glory for it. And I ask it in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. God bless you guys. I love y'all. Hope you have a great rest of the week.